Welcome to Idaho Fish and Game's third installment of the State of Deer and Elk series. This time we'll talk about deer and elk survival in Idaho. IDFG has a few ways we estimate survival of deer and elk, but the most effective way to measure both survival and causes of mortality is to place GPS collars on animals that track their movements and notify biologists when the animal has died. When a caller sends a mortality signal, biologists then conduct what we call a field necropsy to try and understand the circumstances that led to the animal's death. We use information from the carcass and surrounding scene to determine a likely cause of death. Since there are several species that scavenge carcasses, we also have methods to differentiate signs of predation from scavenging, as long as enough evidence remains to do so. For elk and deer in Idaho, the primary sources of mortality can be categorized as hunter harvest, mountain lion predation, wolf predation, bear predation, coyote predation, bobcat predation, accidents like collisions with cars, malnutrition, disease and parasites, and unknown cause, which means there wasn't enough evidence for us to determine the cause of death with confidence. First, we'll look at mule deer. Different sex and age classes of mule deer tend to have different mortality rates, or the portion that die each year, and different primary causes of death. We've used collared animals to estimate the annual mortality of adult bucks, adult does, wintering fawns six to 12 months of age, and newborn fawns from birth to six months of age across several mule deer populations in Idaho. In the following slides, I'll show you average mortality rates and causes of mortality across all mule deer we've monitored with collars in Idaho. But keep in mind that mortality rates and causes of mortality can vary across years and across different parts of the state. When we combine data from 389 collared adult buck mule deer across years and areas, most with general hunting seasons, about 41% of bucks die each year. If we take a look at the sources of that mortality. About 27% is from hunter harvest. About 9% didn't have enough evidence for us to confidently determine the cause of death. About 2% from mountain lion predation, with coyotes, malnutrition, and accidents each taking 1% or less each year. We did not detect any buck mortalities from wolves, bears, bobcats, or disease or parasites. When we combine data from over 3,200 collared adult does, about 20% die each year. About 6% didn't have enough evidence to determine cause of death. Hunter harvest and mountain lion predation each take about 4%. Malnutrition takes about 2%. And other factors take 1% or less each year. When we combine data from over 2,600 collared wintering mule deer fawns, an average of about 54% die each year. About 17% didn't have enough information to determine cause of death. Coyotes and malnutrition each take about 13%. Mountain lions take about 8%. And the other factors take 1% or less each year. Data from 250 collared newborn mule deer fawns suggests about 50% of fawns die in the first six months after birth. Coyotes take about 12%, and about 12% didn't have enough evidence to determine cause of death. Malnutrition takes about 11%. Mountain lions take about 9%. Bobcats and accidents each take about 3%, and bears take about 1%. In summary, hunter harvest and mountain lion predation are typically the first and second most important sources of mortality for adult mule deer. Hunter harvest can vary significantly depending on hunt season structure and tag numbers, but non-harvest mortality of adult deer doesn't tend to vary that much from year to year, except during extreme severe winters or large disease outbreaks. For fawns, coyote predation and malnutrition are the most important factors followed by mountain lion predation. Annual differences in weather and habitat conditions can result in extremely different overwinter fawn survival rates between years. 
Changes in adult doe mortality tend to have the largest effect on mule deer populations, but since doe survival is usually fairly stable between years, changes in overwinter fawn survival between years often becomes the most influential factor driving changes in mule deer populations. Past IDFG research has shown that the primary drivers of overwinter mule deer fawn survival are somewhat different depending on which part of the state you're in. In the conifer-dominated fall habitats of central and eastern Idaho, shown here in dark green, fawn survival increases when winter snows come later in the year, which results in a longer growing season and more feeding opportunity prior to winter. Also, deep snows later in winter decrease fawn survival in these areas. In drier shrub-dominated fall habitats of Idaho, like those shown here in tan, increases in both rain and snow tend to increase plant productivity, which in turn increases fawn survival. In the mixed aspen conifer forests of southeastern Idaho, shown here in light green, fawn survival decreases when there is more, more snow during late fall and winter. Similar to mule deer, we've used collars to estimate annual mortality of adult bulls, adult cows, wintering calves 6 to 12 months of age, and newborn elk calves across several elk populations in Idaho. The following slides show average mortality rates and causes of mortality across all elk we've monitored with collars, but again keep in mind that mortality rates and causes of mortality vary across years and across different parts of the state. When we combine data from 216 collared adult bull elk across years and areas, about 36% of adult bulls die each year. About 18% from hunter harvest, 9% from wolf predation, 4% didn't have enough evidence, 2% from accidents, and about 1% from mountain lions and malnutrition. When we combine data from over 2,700 colored adult cows, about 16% die each year, about 7% from hunter harvest, 4% didn't have enough evidence, 2% from mountain lion predation, and 1% or less from wolves, accidents, malnutrition, and disease or parasites. When we combine data from over 1,600 collared 6 to 12 month old elk calves, about 36% of wintering calves die each year. About 14% from mountain lions, 7% didn't have enough evidence, 6% from both wolf predation and malnutrition, 2% from accidents, and 1% or less from the remaining factors. Our information on newborn elk calf survival in Idaho is mostly limited to two previous studies. The majority of that data was collected in the Clearwater region in the late 1990s, before wolves were fully established in the state. But the major causes of mortality documented during those projects are still consistent with results from more recent studies of calf survival in areas of the western U.S. with established wolves. On average, 45% of newborn calves die within three months of birth. About 23% are taken by bears, 14% by mountain lions, 4% didn't have enough evidence. 2% by accidents, and 1% or less from coyotes, malnutrition, and disease or parasites. In summary, hunter harvest followed by wolf and mountain lion predation are typically the largest sources of mortality for adult elk. Mountain lion predation followed by wolf predation and malnutrition are the most important sources for wintering calves and bear predation followed by mountain lion predation are the most important sources for newborn calves. We use data collected at capture from collared adult cows and 6 to 12 month old calves to see if there were differences in the types of elk these two main predator species killed. Wolves killed elk of all types but tended to take more wintering calves that were small and more of the oldest adult cows whereas mountain lions killed elk of all sizes and ages with no apparent preferences. 
We also use survival data from individual cows and 6 to 12 month old calves, along with data on wolf pack sizes and environmental conditions like snow depth to better, better understand drivers of elk survival. Cows that were older, lived in areas with larger wolf packs, and lived in deeper snow were more likely to die. Calves that were smaller in late December and early January, lived in areas with larger wolf packs, and lived in deeper snow were more likely to die. For both cows and calves, there was also a relationship between wolf pack size and snow depth, where elk were less likely to die when wolf packs were smaller and snow was shallow, and more likely to die when packs were larger and snow was deep. This makes sense as wolf paws are better at staying on top of snow than elk hooves. It's important to note that we didn't have information on mountain lion density to include in this analysis. Since lions take as many or more elk as wolves in most areas of Idaho, it's likely that local mountain lion density would have been an important factor to an elk's survival in this analysis. We are currently in the process of conducting additional research to better understand the dynamics of all predator and prey species, including mountain lions. We haven't done as much collaring of whitetail deer in Idaho, but we have recently begun monitoring whitetail survival in GMUs 1, 6, and 10A as part of our ongoing predator-prey research. Preliminary results suggest that in years without significant disease outbreaks, mountain lion predation and hunter harvest are the leading causes of mortality for adults. Mountain lion predation is the leading cause for wintering fawns 6 to 12 months old, and black bear predation is the leading cause for newborn fawns. So how can we use all this survival information to help us track populations? Newborn fawns and calves that survive grow into wintering fawns and calves. Wintering fawns and calves that survive grow into yearling and then adult animals. Adult does and cows produce newborn fawns and calves. And adults that survive one year are again adults the next year. We can combine all of this information to predict population trends in between abundance surveys and in areas where surveys aren't conducted. Additionally, understanding which sources of mortality are most influential to each of these survival rates helps us better direct our management to the population outcome we are shooting for. Thank you for joining me to hear about survival of deer and elk in Idaho. Tune back to the webpage frequently for the next updates of the state of deer and elk, where management staff will talk to you about the season setting process and how you can get involved. See you later.